Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Chung. Um, this is going to be a, <clears throat> a, a grading switch from TCP packet loss to, uh, <laughs> to the next slide here. Um, and that is Ron Burgundy. <laughs> um, so I'm actually here to talk to you a little bit about what happens when local TV meets digital media. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what Frankly does in that system. Um, but I thought we'd have some fun for a half an hour uh, and kind of explore the opportunity uh, that local TV presents. Uh, because I believe that local TV is one of the most uh, overlooked markets and opportunities in all of media today. That's right, I said that. Local TV is the most missed opportunity in all of media today. Uh, and I'm here to make the case of why that is. By the way, how many of you have watched Anchorman? OK, so most of you know what I'm talking about. OK. He's kind of a big deal. He's the, the local Anchorman, uh, Will Ferrell. So what happened here? <clears throat> well, local TV used to be the dominant sort of interface of audience all over the United States. Your local uh, anchor uh, was really a celebrity. And he or she had a direct relationship with uh, his or her audience. They walk around town. Everybody knows who the anchor is. Um, and uh, you know, across the United States, when TV became a thing, uh, the local anchorman and, and the local TV station really was that anchor point and, and the hub of that community, uh, all until digital uh, sort of came into being. So what happened with digital? Well, first of all, content sort of exploded everywhere. You're talking user-generated content. You're talking social media. Uh, you're talking over-the-top uh, players like Netflix and Hulu. Uh, and that distance between the local TV station and that audience started to get disaggregated. Right? Uh, and with the explosion of content, a lot of uh, audience and, and the, the end users had a lot more choice. Um, so it really uh, started to kind of put a, a disaggregation between the local TV station uh, and uh, the, the end user. So what happens now? Well, uh, this, this aggregation I'm seeing uh, everywhere you look. Uh, so uh, players like the national networks, CBS, uh, for example, obviously have a direct-to-consumer play that cuts out the local TV uh, middleman. Right? It used to be that the networks provide the content to the local TV stations. It's the local TV stations, really, who had that relationship, except for some of the few national um, sort of anchors. Um, so the networks are bypassing the local TV stations and going direct. Hollywood uh, is also looking to go direct. Uh, a lot of the studios that we're talking to have their own OTT and, and direct-to-consumer play that they're working on now. Uh, Silicon Valley, where uh, I'm, I'm based in San Francisco, also through players like Netflix and all the other services are disaggregating local TV from their audience. Uh, even TV manufacturers, uh, we have discussions ongoing with some of the biggest smart TV uh, manufacturers, and they all have a plan to go direct to end users. So local TV is sort of out there, you know, crying uh, a little bit of how do we rescue ourselves from this disaggregation that's happening in every which way. Well, I'm here to tell you that I think local TV still has some mojo, and local TV is not dead yet. Uh, and, and here's why I think that way. So you look at all of the different metrics um, that uh, you look at, OK? Let's look at time spent. Uh, over the past five years, starting from 2010, consistently uh, over four hours of viewing on TV, despite, of course, the plethora of platforms that are being expanded, uh, you still have over four hours uh, of, of TV watching. Uh, that's uh, still happening today, and that's according to uh, Kleiner Perkins um, uh, as well. Second, on local TV, uh, did you know that local TV is still the dominant way that most people get their news from? 82 percent, uh, according to the American Press Institute, um, it is the number one source of news still to this day. Uh, and of course, that number may be shifting, but still, local TV is dominant. Uh, as sort of a, a way for people to get their, their news today. Then you look at size of the market. Well, in cities like LA, where I grew up, uh, or San Francisco, where I live, or New York, where I also used to, to work, 
Uh, local TV possibly can be viewed as, um, as less relevant because of the, the, the explosion of content choices and sources in some of the big metros, even though it's still a very important market for local TV. But you look at the rest of the world, um, where people actually work for a living, uh, and have skills and, and, you know, and, and put in a good amount of work for their money. Uh, and those metros, if you look at the, the DMA uh, below the top 10, you, know, uh, you see uh, roughly about 70% of America do not live in those big metros. Um, and that's about 200 uh, million uh, Americans. And if you're not in one of the top 10 DMAs, the local TV stations often become your primary source of information and news. Uh, things like weather, traffic, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, things that are very relevant, school closings, you know, unfortunately recently, sh you know, shootings, things like that that have a very unique place in our world today has so much relevance. All of that is, is much more accentuated in the rest of the United States where there's still a substantial amount of people um, who obviously live there. So if you look at sort of total size of the relevance of uh, the local TV, um, it's, it's a massive market that's being uh, underutilized and overlooked today. Let's look at dollars, okay? If you look at the, the ad dollars that TV commands today, um, you know, TV still gets about 41% of ad spend in the U.S., uh, according to the latest uh, Kleiner Perkins report. And it beats out, uh, you look at, um, I know we're in the Google offices, but even the revenues of YouTube uh, and some of these other um, sort of ad-supported digital uh, areas, TV is still dominant. Yes, it's changing, but it's still the number one ad spend location. Uh, if, in case you haven't noticed, there are quotes uh, peppered throughout from Anchorman in, in this presentation. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if you look at specifically on local TV, it's about a $20 billion ad uh, market. Uh, coincidentally, uh, the, the newspaper market is roughly around that, but there is a different growth trajectory. Uh, yes, TV is not growing as fast as digital, but it still grew um, uh, about uh, 2 to 7% over the past five years, uh, according to Pew Research. Um, while well, newspapers about the same size is declining uh, for uh, many reasons that we know. Um, so if you look at the total TV and specifically the local TV market, it is still a very, very sizable market. So to recap, on, from a total time spent, four hours plus on TV, uh, from where people get their news from, uh, which is number one on local TV, from you know, the TV ad market in general, and specifically the local TV, it is still a very dominant form of media. Uh, and, you know, don't act like you're not impressed, right? It, it is actually a pretty uh, sobering number. Uh, I know we all like to talk digital, um, but, you know, when you look at the numbers, there's still a lot of mojo in this market. So if you uh, couple all of that uh, data that I just shared with you on the TV and local TV market, and you um, sort of juxtapose that against the macro trends. Um, you know, from my vantage point, the past 10 years has been a, a decade of platform dominance, where players like Facebook and Netflix, um, they actually had, don't have or hadn't had their own content. They were a platform for other people's content. Uh, but as the pendulum swings back to uh, content from platform, and that pendulum, uh, as we know, the arc of history, s keeps swinging back and forth between content and platform, uh, I believe, and a lot of other prognosticators out there, also predict over the next five, ten years that content will become much more relevant in, in sort of uh, retaining that dominance. And we see examples today. So in, in all sort of meetings, I say, look, we are entering the world of now content equals platform. And then just so you know, equals content uh, for, <laughs> for ensuring you got the point. Uh, Netflix, obviously, uh, example everybody knows, are into original programming. It's not uh, sufficient just to be a pipe or a platform. They need original content. Uh, you look at Sinclair, uh, they just recently purchased the, the Tennis Channel for a lot of different reasons, but content being one. Uh, even Major League Baseball, uh, maybe many of you know, they have an OTT platform that powers HBO uh, and a lot of things. That the platforms they use to broadcast 
uh, digitally, their uh, baseball games are being now white labeled as a platform to offer to other uh, content owners. So that's a huge business. Uh, AT&T and Chernin and, and a lot of other initiatives uh, that AT&T have going on on content, marrying the telco pipe to the content. Same with Verizon's uh, purchase of AOL. All of these have a lot of different reasons with complexities behind it, but the basic trend is indisputable that platform providers really view content as one very important way for the next 10 years to unfold. Um, Raycom Media, which you may know, based in Alabama, uh, one of our biggest uh, uh, customers and a shareholder of ours, uh, owns 60 plus TV stations, just announced a, a content deal with Scripps to do original content uh, and they have a series of new initiatives called Southern Weekend, for example, uh, that takes the Southern lifestyle uh, and really produces original content programming for local markets. So across the board, from Silicon Valley to telcos to uh, sports to uh, local TV uh, to national networks, everybody understands that now content and platform are really uh, where the both need to be synergistic with each other to make it a real opportunity. So how do we uh, take all of that trend and uh, help and also take advantage of the opportunity that local media and local TV presents itself? Um, you know, frankly, as a company, um, <clears throat> is taking a stand and making a huge bet on the local TV uh, space, but under three conditions. If these things don't happen, we believe that local TV will go away eventually uh, by the way of the dodo bird, uh, although apparently dodos were smarter uh, than uh, we, they, we used to think, if you guys read that, uh, read that on a local uh, TV site, actually. Um, but number one, what is that condition? You've got to know the audience. Local TV is traditionally called broadcast, and broadcast version is like this. Hello, everyone. <laughs> That's broadcast. I have no idea who you are. Uh, if I go up to you and say, hey, my name is Steve, what do you like to do? What's your name? Where do you live? How many children do you have? What, what do you care about? That's really data, isn't it? To really understand who's in this audience so that I'm not making broad assumptions, you know, maybe some panelistic view of, of the world, but specifically using data to really get to know who the audience is and having a relationship. If I have your cell phone number, I, I now have a much more relationship than if I didn't. If I have your email address, I, I know how to reach you, and we have a, a much more elevated relationship. Uh, you know, we, we call that authentication or user information uh, for tech speak. Uh, we really need to know user data, and the TV stations were perfectly positioned to get that data, but they gave that up to the telcos, to the cable companies, to everybody who came in to disaggregate them. The broadcaster sort of stepped away and said, hey, have my lunch take all of the information of, of my audience that I, I used to have that deepest connection with, but no longer. The TV stations have got to take control of the data, and I know we have a lot of speakers today to talk about that. The interest graph. It's, I can know a lot about you uh, by what articles you are interested in, by what you're reading, by where do you go, by what do you click on, where do you spend the most amount of time. We have all of that technology, and I can start building an interest graph profile of that user or that audience. TV stations also must do that. Location. Guess what? Local TV stations, it's local TV. There's a geographic uh, awareness about their audience. And if you take a city or a town or anything in between, uh, and through a lot of these data collections, you can actually target sort of where they are in a more hyper-local way than national media could ever do. Uh, and more data is more money, ultimately. So overall, the TV stations must get to know their audience better because everybody else has more information than they do right now. The telcos, the cable companies, they have all of your subscription data, your billing information, your credit history, all of that. TV stations really have none of that. So that's the first condition under which this can work. The second is content. Well, why is it that I ch turn on channel five and I go to KTLA? And I see lots of different programs from sitcoms to maybe sports to, you know, Hollywood films and local TV. But if I go to KTLA.com, I only see local news. Hmm. Well, that's kind of the historical way of where local TV digital presence have been is in the news uh, and weather and traffic. Why? Because they only had the rights to that content. 
They didn't have rights to everything else. Well, so you might argue, uh, well, the, the TV stations, why is there a gap between what I see and when I turn on Channel 5 or 11 on Fox or, you know, whatever, 7 on ABC, and I see the, the list of programs, but on the digital, there's a rights gap between what I see on TV and what I see on digital. I believe, and there are a lot of skeptics, that uh, local TV stations are perfectly positioned to broaden their content offering. Not necessarily Hollywood, but Hollywood could be part of that. Why? Because it's all already being broadcast, uh, and the rights issues are complex, but I believe there's an opportunity for TV stations at the local level to be able to access that, given the right terms. Um, original content. Well, there's a lot of content happening around town that they are uniquely positioned to capture. Uh, and that camera in that station is going uh, unused because the cameraman in that TV station is only used to going on location, filming me for 30 minutes on whatever the school closing is, you know, putting his camera down and then going back to the station for all of the editing process. That camera should be on 24-7 in some way, capturing all of the different local content going on. Uh, and, you know, that's the way they're going to stay relevant. Um, you know, syndication, there's a lot of great value. Today, 90% or more of the local TV content gets broadcast and it's forgotten forever. Uh, it's sort of sitting there. There's a lot of synergies to syndicating that content around the world, uh, around the United States, and enhancing that with other content to really be a player uh, in that content syndication world. So, in short, I think there's a huge opportunity for local TV stations to broaden their content offering and become much more relevant again. Lastly, I call this multi-platform growth hacking. And growth hacking is a term we use in Silicon Valley to mean a lot of different things. But Silicon Valley has made growth hacking, uh, which is this idea of taking experiments and using a relatively scientific approach to grow your audience. Um, into more of a science than an art. Uh, so all the tech companies that are consumer-oriented, Google certainly, uh, has armies of growth hackers. They may not be called growth hackers, but that's what they're doing. Facebook has thousands of experiments happening every day in parallel to test different features. Uh, TV, you know, uh, has really no... I originally, before we got into this space, thought TV stations were great at marketing because you sort of think, TV is marketing and media, but TV stations are horrible marketers. Uh, and they need to really understand that they have a, a massive platform and a, and a pulpit. Nobody says, hey, mom, I'm on the internet. Okay, maybe a little bit. People still get very giddy. Hey, mom, I'm on TV. Something about that camera and lights and action, and it still creates a visceral reaction in a positive way. TV has such a, uh, a sexy, sexiness and appeal today that they're uh, really giving up, you know, to, to borrow my, another favorite movie, The 40-Year-Old Virgin. They said, hey, is it true that if you don't use it, you'll lose it? Um, and the answer is yes, okay? If, you, if TV does not use its star power to get to where they need to go, they're going to lose it. Uh, so take the advice. You've got to use it or you'll lose it. Uh, so, you know, it, it's... All the other players, Netflix, Samsung, you know, Hulu, uh, AT&T, Verizon, they all have their own unique edge to bring to the table. TV has the TV edge, and it's arguably the most powerful edge, the most strongest, most unique edge, and they're not using that at all. So multi-platform growth hacking means tying your digital user acquisition strategy to the broadcast strategy, uh, to your connected device strategy, to your data strategy, to the advertising strategy, and making sure that each of those platforms has a unique strategy that tie together in what I call multi-platform growth hacking that TV stations must do, not fragmented potpourri collections of things that they read somewhere that they're sort of replicating. So. If TV stations can do these things, one is to know the audience, two is to broaden their content offerings, and three, to have a holistic multi-platform growth hacking strategy, I argue that they are one of the most well-positioned players in the media landscape uh, to take advantage of that. So, that is the end of my talk, uh, and uh, I, I, I hope what I've done in the least is to raise the possibility and tickle your fancy a little bit about why, frankly, is uh, in this market and why we're such big believers. 
Um, and so uh, I hope that uh, I've made some of you believers. Uh, and, you know, given the right strategies, I think it's a huge opportunity for everybody in this room uh, to take advantage of. So thank you very much. So I'd actually like to hear a little bit more about the stats. Sure. What kind of traffic you're doing and dealing with. Yeah, so in fact, that's a great segue about a little bit about our company. We're public on the Toronto Exchange. Um, uh, I started the company three years ago. Uh, we did our IPO a, year, a little over a year ago. Uh, today, we're about a little over 100 people, do a little over 20 million in revenues. Um, and the size of our footprint, what we do today is basically offer a one-stop turnkey solution for local TV stations to publish all of their content digitally. So through our sort of content management system, TV stations log in every day to publish to their official website, to their mobile web, to their mobile apps, to connected TV. Uh, and so it's a software as a service platform uh, that we make uh, available to over 200 TV stations who are our customers today. In aggregate, we reach about 80 million monthly active users. Uh, and if you just look at the Comscore uh, media metrics, we're sort of ranked 75-ish, right below the iHeartRadio network in terms of our user reach. Um, that's a little bit about our platform. We also have a monetization side of our business where we have a dozen people in New York uh, that uh, basically sell both direct and programmatic advertising onto those digital uh, platforms, and we revenue share that back with our TV stations. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, our company. Uh, we are backed by Stanford University, uh, SK Telecom in South Korea, Raycom Media, U.S. media company, uh, and, a, and a host of other Canadian uh, investors and private equity firms. It's a little bit about us. Excellent. Questions from the audience? Are you helping the local stations to find content or directing them to build content? Because it sounds like you know what was missing, they just took the network feed did the news and they shut the lights off and went home. Correct. I worked at a local station, so I know. Okay. Yeah, it's a great point. So obviously we're not content creators. We, we would never pretend to be that. So uh, we help content sourcing in a number of ways. One, we help each of our customers help syndicate their content to other customers of ours. So it's sort of a content syndication pool. That's one. Two, we enhance that with external content, people like uh, Associated Press and a lot of other uh, specialty content uh, players, actually many of them in LA, have been approaching us to put their content into our content pool so that those can be taken down easily by our local TV stations across the United States to use. Um, and then of course, third, looking at other ways, in fact, we've been getting a lot of interest from studios recently uh, who want to use our footprint to have an alternative way than just Netflix or Hulu or you know, the networks to go direct to consumers. And so there could be a little bit of a union there on uh, Hollywood Studios actually partnering directly with local TV stations to make some of their libraries available. So we're ha helping, because we, if we can help our customers succeed and, and the users will stay there longer and watch more and stay more, then we will all make more money. So we, we believe that you know, to my second point, content expansion is key and we must be there to help where we can. So yes. Yeah. So can you explain the uh, mechanism of how like a local station um, comes to you with their material, their clips? Do they upload clips and then you add metadata to those clips or do they add all the metadata to begin with? And yep. how is that distributed? Sure. That yep. So thank you for the question. We power the whole official site. So that has everything from video, video being linear and VOD. Uh, so we have uh, content ingestion points. We have physical boxes. Thousands of our servers are located in the TV stations to take in the content, uh, ingest the feed, goes into our system, and it could be uh, you know, basically edited while it's being played out linearly. If it's a live situation, uh, for the most part, it's VOD. Uh, so uh, they use our systems to edit those videos and then directly publish it out. But we also not only video, we have text. So that's kind of the WordPress version, if you will. Um, so TV stations write articles for the, the digital platform. So they use our platform also to, for the text creation. And then, of course, photos and slideshows. That's a module within our system. Um, and then social feeds and social data. 
you know, weather integration with WSI, traffic information, um, you know, everything you see on the, the TV station platform sort of comes through us either directly or through our uh, sort of API or SDK integrations into our content sources. Then, you know, edit, edit, click publish, and it basically gets simultaneously published out to the desktop, mobile web, and shortly we'll be announcing uh, some big things at NAB this year. Uh, the, our vision is truly one stop, one platform, one dashboard. You click publish, and it should publish to mobile apps. It should publish to Apple TV. It should publish to Fire uh, TV. It should publish to you know Xbox. It should publish to any endpoints. Uh, today, the workflow looks like I got to log into this system for the web. I got to log into this system for apps. I got to log into this system for this and this system for that. TV stations are trying to do more with less, and this is not working for them. So what we hope to do is say, content owner, you, you focus on the content. We'll take care of the, the rest. Um, and going forward, you know, local TV is, is obviously our focus, and we are huge believers of that. But the system that we have can work equally well for any content owner. Studios, for example, who, as I said, are coming to us to uh, use our platform to go direct to uh, users too. Any content owner, doesn't matter, a, a blogger to a YouTuber to studios and anything in between can use our platform to publish content across multiple devices uh, and we're equipped to do that. All right. Any other ones? Well, so ho hope that was entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Uh, we're going to take a 20-minute break. We've got a bunch of snacks and refreshments for you. So uh, back right around 4. Okay. Thank you.